<laughs> Lizzie Holmes. Here you are. Look, creative entrepreneur. You 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 on the stage of the world, Royal Opera House, Grange Park, Wexford, Longborough, all over the place. Look, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm going to hide myself, you, because no one wants to see themselves when they're doing these things, do they? You you have so many things on your plate. You're spinning lots of plates. It's fair to say. How how do you find? Where do you get the, your energy from and your sort of, you know, your desire to keep growing things? Where's where's that come from? I, I, it's an addiction. It's actually an addiction. Um, I love opera. I love classical music. I love the world that we exist in. And I love trying to fight to make it loved by more people, accessible to more people. Um, and it is a compulsion. Yeah, I wake up, I think about it. It's the love of my life, aside from my partner and my family. <laughs> um, yeah, in, in the lockdown, I've as probably lots of people did, I had like a full on breakdown because as you said, as musicians, we juggle so many things that that to have nothing to fight for or or to do was was horrible. Have you always wanted to pursue singing? Has it always been on your agenda or is it sort of um has it sort of developed over time? My mum remembers me singing a we're walking in the air, aged like nine. Um, and then I went to a school that really championed performing arts alongside academia as well, Frencham Heights. I sang in the choirs and I did do my singing exams, but they were always just a bit of fun, really. I got my, you know, distinction grade eight and stuff, but I never studied music. I didn't even study it for GCSE. So in a way, I feel like a bit of a fraud because even when I did my master's at the Royal College of Music, I was like, have I really learned properly about music? I'm not sure. But um, it was it was a passion and it was something that I pursued. I actually did an undergrad in English at Warwick University first. I met my singing teacher who I still have now. A, you know, how many years is that? A, a, over a decade. I went through loads of teachers at RCM, uh, Royal College of Music. And then I've gone back to her, but she said, oh, you should, you should take a look at, at opera. Uh, and I did, and it encompassed everything I loved about the performing arts. It was like this total art form and it was hard, so hard. Uh, and that was, yeah, where I discovered it. And then I actually tried to get into music college. I applied for the wrong courses. I applied for um, opera school having just done an undergrad in English, and that was bad. Uh, f failed, obviously, all five all five colleges and applied again the next year. And, and I got in everywhere, which was super cool. Um, and then went to the Royal College of Music. And then that was where it kind of, the passion started. Does Do you think that the sort of process of putting on an opera relates to your kind of business journey and your interest there? And that's something, you know, of particular interest to me where kind of music and business, they sort of, they, they you know, bang, they come together. Do you think that, um, so, I, you know, you're teaching at the, or, or you've taught at the Royal College of Music doing your creative entrepreneurship thing. Um, can you just talk a bit about how business works for you in your kind of day to day? So straight after the RCM, I went into Phantom of the Opera for a couple of years. And it was really amazing to see how the world of musical theatre operates and their business and to see how they are selling out every single night and they have packed audiences and that show has run for 20 I don't know over 30 years now and and so I was inspired to think is there is there a slightly different way of doing this can we look at it in a, a different angle um so I had that feeding in and at the same time uh, after going to Warwick University, I was part of a devised theatre ensemble. We went up to the Fringe and we won a Fringe first. And it was all about creating very experiential theatre. So it was kind of combining those two, two ideas and loves. And then another factor came in, which was these, these concerts. So our kind of flagship concert series is at the Shoreditch Treehouse. And we started doing them and then we ended up partnering with Airbnb and so we sold tickets through them. So again it was this world of of business and they've got such a successful 
model and they have such an engaged um, community who are really, really, really interested in kind of delving into local places, local experiences. So that's really where the idea to take classical music kind of out of the conventional concert hall and go, how can we, how can we wrap this up? How can we do it differently so that anyone in the street goes, oh my gosh, that looks super cool. Not just, you know, they may not know anything about the music, but if they see that it looks like a really fun night out, we love experiences nowadays. And, and that is really what drives it. The music will always speak for itself. I've not come across anyone who hasn't listened to, no, maybe it's got to be in like, maybe it's not then going to be 15 minutes with no explanation of what it's about. But good quality music speaks for itself. Anytime I watch anyone watch a great performer, they are in love. And it's just about getting them there and getting them to have like a personal relationship with them instead of this classic classical music opera thing, which is like, only see me as this, you know, in a, a huge dress and from very far away. So we're, we're trying to fight against that. It, it, it's quite a modern phenomenon, isn't it? This, this idea that an opera audience has to sit in complete silence and sort of solitude and, and listen to every single note. If you look back to like, I don't know, Handel, Purcell, Mozart, the, the, the whole concept was you were going for an actual night out and you were sort of, you, there was a lot of chatter in the theatres of the day. And this whole concept of, you know, you've got to sit there in complete silence goes against the actual experience of music. And I think what you're doing and giving a platform um, is really a splendid idea. So well done. Well, but Ben, that said, people talking during a performance is a. <laughs> so in that way, we're like really traditional. It is in yep. no way background music, but it's in more kind of bite sizable chunks. So um, the programming at Treehouse is like three sets of 25 minutes and then there's time for drinks and fun and games and time to chat to the musicians between. But also between the actual pieces of music, the, the musician will talk about that and sometimes questions will get thrown up from the audience, but no, there has, you can hear a pin drop when the music's being performed. Mm. And I think that there, it, that is so important. And it is, there is this like holy space then associated with a group of people sharing in that same moment. I don't know about you, but for me, the most holy moment is that silence after a performance finishes and before the applause starts. That is everything. Yeah, that, 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 that final chord sort of dying away to nothing and then the, the moment afterwards. And you can always tell if it's been particularly moving because that silence is elongated. And it's and very few and far between to get those moments in today's busy world because I don't know how you feel, but music is a, it's so superfluous. It's all over the place. Anywhere you go in the city, especially, there's always some sort of music, so this sort of background, this, this music, you know, they used to call it the elevator music. And I think that's important that a performance is a performance and it just elevates it, doesn't it? Just gives it that yeah. sense of lift. And I do still love music. I have Classic FM on the whole day, all day. And um, I just let that roll in the background. And that is great that kind of Spotify and everywhere is is making it so accessible. I think that the amount of people listening to classical music has skyrocketed because they they put it on and they they use it to work to, which is amazing. What a great introduction to it. So let's talk about Lizzie Holmes, the singer. So in your... Um... I wonder if you ever have those moments where you, you're looking around, and you're thinking, oh, that singer, they're so good. What a splendid singer. And, and you, how do you cope with that sort of cross, you know, comparing yourself to other, other people? Is that something that affects you in your career? Yeah, of course. And, and I think it affects everyone. We're now in this also age of obviously social media and everyone's posting, you know, everyone's trying to do their best to just share what they're doing but it can, it can be really overwhelming. Um, my singing teacher always said, as all the great people do say, you're only in competition with yourself. But obviously if you don't get a part and then you're instantly Googling who got the role instead of you, um, it happens. And I guess it's a constant battle and a constant 
acceptance that that all you need to do is kind of keep pressing on um, and finding your own path. I think it's much easier now being out of music college. That and I've said that we've I've done a couple of talks for the RCM this week, and saying that 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 is like this melting pot of everyone's the same as you. And we've all probably come from places where we've all been quite exceptional and you have to be exceptional to get into good conservatoires. Um, and then you're all the, you feel like you're all the same. Lots of people lose their kind of self-worth and their identity. I did a little, yeah, I did. Um, and then you come out and you're trying to rebuild that and, and let who you are re-blossom. Um, and then it's easier. And then it's easier to find the people that you work with inspiring rather than rivals. And I always try and remind myself that we're not the one casting. So there's no point in me being a monster to any, any soprano or horrible, you know, in it, because the only time you're going to be working with each other is if you're actually working with each other, you have to play sisters or, and, and, and bad blood is, um, is no good for anyone. Yeah. So I just try and press on and, and instead embrace the community because you must be the same as freelance musicians. It can be a really lonely place. It, it, and it can. And there are those moments of sort of, we'll call them down days, you know, where you have a couple of days and you, your phone doesn't ring with a booking or something. And you're thinking, what's happened? Have I chosen the right? And I wonder for you, have there been have you always been content with your career? It's a bit of a leading question. But have you have there been moments where you thought, I'm not sure about music anymore. I'm going to try something different. Or have you always had that sort of that that flame that's that's you know kept burning? Well, that's why I'm so lucky because of debut and, and the work that we do there, it can take up it, it works so nicely in synchronicity, like this portfolio career as a performer, and then alongside running a business where I get to make all the decisions. And if I don't have any work coming to me, then I can choose to create work and I can choose to create opportunities. And as you probably know, I often like to be in control. Um, and so it means that it takes the pressure of me turning up to an audition and really needing a job. Instead, it's I, I can turn up and I can go, this is what I, I do, this is how I do it. I put a lot of work into training. Uh, if you want it, fantastic. And if you don't, it's okay. I've got lots of other things on the go. And ironically, um, it's meant that there's now loads of jobs coming in, which is fantastic. Um, and some, like my first booking for an opera job for 2023, which is a really big deal for me. Um, so yeah, it, it has given me the flexibility and the freedom and the confidence to not worry so much on the down days. Lizzie, I have one more question for you. People are going to uh, love hearing from you, but the, the question that I, I have is um, when, and you can interpret this in any way that you like, there's no, you know, correct formula in perhaps in music, when is enough enough? And do you think you'll ever be certain when you sort of reach that point? Oh, Ben, is enough ever enough for you? I'll tell you if you if you go first. <laughs> well, uh, what is this fight for perfectionism as well, isn't it? That is um, can be all consuming for performers, and I think that the the work with debut and me constantly remembering to reconnect with what is important, which is the people and the community who are enjoying that makes a huge difference. Instead of, of course, the, the hard work, the time, the practice at the piano is so important, but if you can't communicate and um, effectively share with an audience and portray the raw emotion, I would much rather see it's probably because I'm that kind of performer, <laughs> someone who is sharing themselves more and risking more than someone who is technically perfect, but then is so perfect that their personality isn't able to shine through. 
obviously the aim is to get both to the absolute top notch level, but I would always, um, I would always champion watching a, a performer that I really feel connects with the music rather than technical perfection. I suppose I owe you an answer as well. I think you're quite right. The community is important. And the more I go on, the more I think it's about a journey, isn't it? And it's about telling a story and it's about a sense of purpose. So I think it's just embracing the slight imperfection in music and realising there's a joy in that that we can capture. Lizzie Holmes, thank you so much for talking with me. It's been a real pleasure. 